Man, I thought we were just going to have a prayer meeting today. Hello, somebody. We doing good, church? Come on, we doing good? And it is so good to be with you today. And um, man, I just love what God is doing. And, and uh, we just honor, we take this moment to honor the faith of everybody who has gone to be at Love Church North Omaha today. And um, I'm just so encouraged by their faith. And if we haven't met, uh, my name is Pastor Michael Connell. Get the privilege of serving as associate lead pastor here. And uh, it's such an honor and privilege to be a part of this church, man. I just, I love Sundays. I was reflecting on it yesterday, and here's why I love, here's why I love Sundays. Because we just sang the song, Miracle After Miracle, and when I come in here on Sundays, all I have to do is look to my right and to my left to see miracle after miracle. When I look to my right and my left, and I see addictions broken, relationships restored, people walking in divine purpose, you know what it does in me? It stirs my faith up. That's the beautiful thing is we gather and we get filled so that we can scatter and go make a difference. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about in here today. So I'm not going to apologize for my passion today. I am fired up, y'all. I'm ready to I'm ready to lean in. And I need this. I need this 11 o'clock crew to lean in with me. Um, are you are y'all ready for this? I do want to do this before we lean in. I, I think this is fun. Um, there's a lot of people that stirred up a lot of faith to go be a part of this launch in North Omaha. And one of the leaders on our team was like, hey, OC, um, there's not enough encouragement that you can give the launch team. Like, when you feel like you've encouraged them enough, you're just getting started. I'm like, yes, sir, I will, let's encourage them. So can we encourage them right now? I, I wanna encourage them like right here, right now. Can we do it? All right, I need your help in a second, okay? Here we go. Love Church North Omaha, come on, we are inspired by your faith. We are believing that God is already moving and we pray that he would equip you for every good work. Let me just tell you, uh, he is gonna move powerfully, not just in you, but through you to see a community flourish. We're incredibly proud of you here at Elkhorn South. Come on, show them some love, church. Come on, show them some love, church! Proud of y'all. So good. Man, y'all are fun, man. Who, who said church couldn't be fun? And uh, I get, actually, as a matter of fact, I give you permission to get your phone out. It's, uh, I was thinking of this um, as I was recording this, the testimonies, and there's nobody that could speak to it more uh, than Pastor Cap Chatfield on the front row. I mean, he's experiencing this. Behind every screen is a soul that Jesus paid a high price for. And honestly, uh, we wanna do everything short of sin to reach people. And so even when you're here on a Sunday morning, I don't know what it looks like, but some of y'all young people that are good on the whole social media thing, like don't be afraid to grab photos, tag, love church. Here's why. I, uh, I heard this testimony a couple years ago. This young guy showed up. He came into our lobby, I was connecting with him. I said, man, how'd you, how'd you find out about the church? He said, I saw, I saw something on TikTok, and so I showed up. He shows up, he gives his life to Christ, he gets baptized, and then he joins a group, and his whole world was changed, all because one of y'all on Snapchat decided to post something about Love Church. God will use anything to reach people. Are you with me today? And so um, we're gonna lean in here today. Y'all ready to lean in? Luke chapter 19 is where we'll be. And I'm excited to, to share this word. It's been a crazy couple of weeks for us. And I said it last time I preached, I said, I'm gonna make the devil pay for this. Well, we're gonna do that again today. So, so Father, we come before you and we're thankful that your word is alive, sharpened in the two-edged sword. And I pray that today uh, you would just encourage your people um, that as we lean into this word, that something would be stirred up in us to wanna take the gospel message to the ends of the earth, to our neighbors, to our workplaces, to our schools. We know that this is what you've called us to. And so Father, I just pray right now for a softening of hearts, that you would open our ears, that you would limit distraction, that your Holy Spirit would begin moving in this encounter. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 
Amen. Well, you have you ever had an unexpected visit? I'm talking about maybe somebody shows up to your doorstep and you weren't expecting them. Maybe there's some of you in here today that you, uh, you thought your boss was out of town and then he showed up to the office <laughs> a little bit early and you got caught slipping with your feet up on your desk and maybe catching a little snooze. I don't know what it is, but I, I recall this one moment where um, I got exposed because somebody showed up to my door and it was unexpected. I remember we moved into our new home a couple years ago and my wife and I, uh, we were literally just in a couple days. We finally got our bed set up and on this one particular night, we were getting ready to go to bed and at the time, we had no curtains on our window and so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting ready for bed and and I'm in my chonies and I'm ready to get in this bed and I'm staring out the window and it's pitch black and next thing you know, I start seeing a bunch of flashlights in my backyard. I'm like, oh my goodness, don't tell me I'm getting pranked by a bunch of teenagers already. No, y'all teenagers are too good for any of that stuff. So, so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, oh man, who, who is in my backyard with the flashlights? Like what's going on here as I'm looking out the window and these flashlights are kind of moving all over the place and if I'm really honest, I was a little bit startled. I was a little bit, I didn't really know what to do in this moment, so I just kind of froze a little bit because I'm thinking, who in the world is in my backyard with the flashlights? Next thing you know, the flashlights turn towards my window and now things are getting really awkward. I'm standing there in my chonies with no shirt on and these flashlights are pointing right at me and there's two flashlights and they're so bright that I can't even see who's on the other side of the flashlight. So I don't know if I'm just gonna stand there to my death and my demise. I don't know what's going on. But I'm trying to figure out, and the flashlights are moving closer and closer to my window, and the closer and closer they get, the thought I'm thinking is this is getting more and more awkward. Next thing you know, I start to kinda realize that there are two sheriffs in my backyard coming towards my window, and I'm thinking, what in the world are these sheriffs doing? Like, am I under arrest? Did I break the law? You know, all these different thoughts are going through your head. Like, what in the world is going on here? Well, long story short, they're pointing at me like, go to your front door. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll go to my front door. This is so awkward. I'm like answering the door in my chonies with no shirt on and two sheriffs. Like, what is going on right now? I'm thinking, what in the world did I just get myself into? Are you kidding me right now? And uh, they, they said, hey, um, your, your security system alarm is going off, and I'm thinking, it's not going off in my house, like, what is, we just got this thing installed earlier today, like, something's gotta be wrong here, this is just a, a, a big fun prank, isn't it, like, what's going on here, and they're like, no, it's, it's tripped off, and I, I thought to myself, I was not expecting this at all, like, this was awkward, this was weird, I got exposed, because I wasn't expecting two sheriffs to show up on my doorstep, are you with me today? When I started thinking about this story, it just, it just got me to thinking that, you know, the Bible says that we don't know the hour in which Jesus is gonna return. As a matter of fact, we'll take it a step further. We don't know the hour that Jesus is gonna return, but we don't know the hour in which he's gonna call us home. See, isn't it true that, just put your hand over your heart right now, you feel that heart beating, you, you feel those lungs expanding. So often we take the little miracles in life for granted, don't we? And it's so often that we just, we just all kind of go on with our life, we're living in cruise control, but the reality is, is there is an hour that Jesus will return or an hour that he will call us home, and the question I wanna ask us today is when he calls us home or when he returns, what kind of report will we be able to give? In other words, how are you and I stewarding the life that he's called you and I to steward? Now, I wanna set something straight here today. What I need you to know in the room this size is there are some of you that you have surrendered to Jesus, you have received the free gift of salvation by grace, not by your own good works, not by your own effort, not by your striving, but because he is good, because Jesus loves you, because he did it for you. You have received it, and there are others of you in here today that you haven't, and that's okay. You're in the right place today. And today, here's what we're gonna hit on is James talks about this, that faith without works is what, it's dead. 
We don't work for our salvation, but we work from it. How many of you know that we get saved and then we begin to walk out this process called sanctification? This is where transformation occurs. This is where you and I, once the gospel is deposited in us, now we are carriers of the gospel and we take it to the ends of the earth. We are called to live life on mission. Somebody say on mission. So the question that we need to ask ourselves this morning is if Jesus were to come back today or if he were to call you home, would you be ready to give an account for your life? Think about that. It's a very sobering question. What would your report be full of? Would it be a report of obedience or disobedience? Stewarding or squandering? Would it be one that is a report of going to your neighbors, your workplace, your school, and sharing the gospel? Or would it be one of showing up to church and guarding the gospel? See, this is this question, these questions I've been asking myself personally because. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been walking through this trial and this tribulation that my wife has been walking through. Many of you know the last time I preached on this platform, I was sharing with you how my wife's appendix ruptured and she had to have, it, she had to have emergency surgery to have it removed. And then uh, the crazy thing is, is one week after this surgery or a little bit over a week passed by, she started to form, form an abscess. And so we had to get readmitted to the hospital last Sunday Last Sunday, we were in the hospital. She was getting another procedure. And on Sunday afternoon, she was fighting for her life. She, her body was starting to experience sepsis. Now, by the grace of God and the mercy of God, she is back home celebrating her 35th birthday today. It's a reminder that we won't go home until he calls us home. But this was a sobering situation for our family, an incredibly sobering situation when I heard the doctors say that if you would have waited much longer, you may not be with us. Now, it's these kinds of conversations that cause us to contemplate the brevity of life. My wife is 34 years old at the time, now 35. She's very young. And I think there's many of us that we live this life as if just, we're just guaranteed old age. We're just guaranteed uh, another day. I just caught wind of a friend of mine. He, was, he wrote the book, uh, Giftology, Incre incredible book. His name's John Rulin. I got to hang out with him in Colorado last November. He was on family vacation a few days ago with his four girls and his wife. He falls over and he's pronounced dead. His life is over, it's gone. His time is up and now he's standing before his maker and he's gotta give an account for his life. Now, what we need to understand is uh, there's going to be two judgments when we stand before our king. The first judgment is, did we, did we make peace with Jesus? Are, are we saved? Are we, wh where are we going, heaven or hell? Like, that's, that's the first judgment. But how many of you know, and Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians, that there's a second judgment seat. It's called the Bema seat. This is where you and I are judged for what we did with the life that we had as believers. Do you know this? Do, do you know that it's actually okay, I think, to have a motivation to be rewarded in heaven? Because here's the deal. When you and I stand before him, the question we've got to ask ourselves is, are we going to be rebuked or are we going to be rewarded? Are we going to be rebuked or are we going to be rewarded? And Jesus is going to address this here in Luke chapter 19 as we get into this text today. Now, verse 11 of Luke chapter 19 gives us context. I want us to catch this. It says this, that the crowd was listening to everything Jesus said. What we need to recognize here is there was a large crowd following Jesus because Jesus was heading from Jericho to Jerusalem. The reason he was heading from Jericho to Jerusalem is because the Jews were heading to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Now, why is this important and what is Passover for those of you that are new to the Bible? Passover is... Uh, was a holiday or a feast that the Jews celebrated, and what they were celebrating was their liberation from foreign oppression. In other words, do you remember when they were in captivity for over 400 years in Egypt, and then God set them free? This is what they're celebrating, is they're celebrating that freedom that they experienced. However, they're full of emotional turmoil during this time as they're heading towards Jerusalem because at the time, they're under the thumb of the Roman Empire. 
So think of the dichotomy here. They're celebrating freedom from foreign oppression while they're under foreign oppression. Can you imagine what was maybe stirred up in them? It gives us more grace to understand the yearning that was in their heart. See, we have to understand what the Jews were looking for was a Messiah that was gonna come and rule and reign, that was gonna overthrow Rome and set up kingdom. We know this because in Zechariah chapter 14, it talks about how there's gonna be a time that comes, and this will come in the future, but they thought the time was now where Jesus was gonna come to the Mount, Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives was gonna split from the east to the west, and he was gonna be king that would rule over all. See, they were thinking that here he is, He's gonna come and overthrow Rome. And here's what Jesus says. And because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story, here it is, to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. So what we need to understand is this parable is really a parable of correction. It's a parable that's gonna give them greater understanding and revelation of who Jesus is and the mission that he's up to. Because we know this, that Jesus wasn't coming to overthrow Rome and set up his kingdom yet. He was coming to offer salvation. He came to seek and save that which is lost. Is anybody thankful that that was his mission? We're thankful for salvation. Verse 12 is where we see the opportunity. If you're a note taker in here, you can see the opportunity that Jesus is going to display through this parable. In verse 12, he says this. A nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Now, to the Jews, there was actually a particular time period in history where an experience like this happened with a guy named Archelaus. Now, why this is important for us to understand is because oftentimes when Jesus would teach a parable, what he was doing is he would take a known thing to bring revelation and understanding to an unknown thing. Do you see what I'm saying? So this is why he's teaching a parable, and the Jews here would understand where he's about to go with this. Check this out. It says, before he left, he called together 10 of his servants and divided among them 10 pounds of silver. Now we need to pause here because um, there are some uh, translations that say mina, M-I-N-A. So what we need to understand about the context here is there's 10 servants, and this, this, this nobleman is dividing among them 10 pounds of silver. In other words, each person is getting one pound of silver. One pound of silver was about 100 days of wage. One, one a pound of silver would be equal to about $10,000 US dollars today. Now here's what he says to do with it. So he gives this out to his servants and he says this, invest this for me while I'm gone. Invest it. Any business folks in the room, right? You, you want to return on your investment. Invest this for me while I'm gone. Verse 14, but his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we do not want him to be our king. Now, pause here. This is not the servant saying this. This is the people. There's two camps of people here. There's his servants and then there's a group of people, the crowd, right? And I think it's true today. We think about King Jesus. Jesus is either the most loved name or the most hated name, depending on who you're talking to. Are you with me? Yeah. Is anybody with me today? Yeah. And so we see here that that's what's happening. But the first thing that we need to catch from this text is this. I want you to write it down. Every believer has equal opportunity. Every believer has equal opportunity. What this master is saying here, as he gives away to each servant the same amount of silver, what we need to catch from this is that the treasure that you and I have received is the gospel of the grace of God. Here's the beautiful thing about the gospel. The gospel's value doesn't change on who's carrying it. Let that sink in for a second. The power is in the message, not the messenger. Some of us wanna disqualify ourselves because we're measuring our capacity to somebody else's. This is not the parable of the talents, y'all. This is a different thing. Jesus is trying to teach a principle here. And here's what I came in here today, that you need to know this, that every believer has been given equal opportunity. Not equal capacity, 
but equal commodity. The commodity is the same. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says this, put my money to work, invest it, use what I'm giving you to increase my investment in you. And I believe this is the same message that Jesus would want to send to us today. Put my gospel to work. Invest it. Don't guard it. Don't hoard it. Don't hold on to it. Go into all the world and preach it. Share it. Give it away. Be light. Invite. Recite. I know a pastor that says that. Come on, somebody. He's right over here. Go take his class. Share your faith simply. I want to ask you a question. When did you receive your spiritual capital? Because there's an investor and his name is Jesus. He's a nobleman and he says, yo, I'm going to prepare a place for you. There's a seat at the table, but while I'm away, let me just tell you, I'm expecting a return on your life and either you're gonna come back and give me a report and an account that I can reward or I'm gonna have to rebuke. What's it gonna be? Each of us has to ask this question. I remember in 2007 when I received my spiritual capital. I was uh, playing college football at Iowa State University. And if somebody would have asked me the question, are you going to heaven, Mike, I would have said, oh yeah. I mean, I grew up going to private Catholic school. I mean, I know who, knew who Jesus was. I, I knew all the things, I had the head knowledge, but it hadn't transferred and moved into my heart. As a matter of fact, if you would have asked me that question, I probably would have told you that the reason why I thought I would spend eternity with Jesus is because I'm a good person. Now what you need to understand is I was looking to my right and to my left and I was measuring my life against the people around me. So I would say I'm not as bad as that person or I don't make the decisions that he makes so God must be good with me. The reality is, is there's a lot of people that walk in and out of churches every single Sunday with this same mindset. The problem with the mindset is it's not the truth. The truth, when I entered into that vehicle in 2007 in a Hollywood video parking lot, is that I was dead in my sin. And I was separated from a holy God. Now, this is really bad news, and to hear the bad news really stinks, doesn't it? It kind of stings. It kind of makes you frustrated. It kind of makes you mad. It kind of makes you angry. It kind of makes you go, man, who is this God? Until you start to hear the good news, that God didn't leave us there that God loved me so much that he actually left heaven and came to earth and lived the life that I couldn't. He died the death that I deserve and he paid my debt when he shed his blood on that cross. When he died on that cross and they put him in the grave, he proved who he was when he rose from that grave. And what my friend told me in that car in 2007 is that all you need to do is receive the free gift. He asked me if I wanted to receive it and I said, you better believe it, I wanna receive it. See, when you understand the gospel, why would you not receive the free gift? But it doesn't stop there, church, because that's when I received my spiritual capital. In other words, I didn't do a thing to earn that. But you better believe that faith without works is dead. So what Jesus said is, I'm, I am going to fill you and I'm gonna send you. The great commission is go into the world. It's not go into the church and guard the gospel. It's go into the world and share the gospel. I can't take the transformation that I've received and keep it to myself. I'm called and I'm commissioned to give it away. Somebody say, give it away. Give it away in your workplace. Give it away in your neighborhood. Give it away in your schools. Let me talk to the students for just a second. Steward your influence. Steward your influence. We know this, that, the, that Francis of Assisi said this. He said, uh, preach the gospel at all times and use, the words, and use words occasionally. What I'm gonna say is this. Preach the gospel at all times by the way that you live and don't be afraid to open your mouth. Don't be afraid to testify why you're different. Don't be afraid to testify why you, you do life different. Listen, we don't need to put the lampshade on in this hour. The Bible says that the darkness will never extinguish the light. You carry the hope of the world. You carry Jesus, the powerful one, inside of you. There's nothing to be afraid of, for God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Is anybody with me today? The fear of man is a snare, and we've got to break out of that trap today. Come on, is anybody with me? Does anybody feel like getting dangerous or risky this morning in church? He's looking for us to, to say, man, I'm thankful for the opportunity. How many of you know this, that 
our appreciation and gratitude for the opportunity is revealed in the way that we steward it, in the way that we share it, in the way that we give it away. Are you with me? We see here that, that in this moment, they were given this opportunity. These servants were given an opportunity to multiply the spiritual capital that was given to them by the noblemen. You and I are called to the same thing. Jesus has given us the gospel, and he's saying, I'm looking for multiplication. Now, here we go. Let's check out the results. Somebody say results. No. Results. We need to catch this this morning because every believer has equal opportunity but not equal results. Ooh, let that sit in for a second. Equal opportunity but not equal results. Check it out. Verse 15, after he was crowned king, here it is, he returned and called in the servants to whom he had given the money. When I read this, I kind of felt like the sheriffs when they showed up at my house. Oh, no. I didn't know if he was going to come back. He wanted to find out what their profits were. So he calls in the first servant. The first servant reported, Master, I invested your money. I took what you gave me and I put it to work. I invested your money and made 10 times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You are a good servant. You have been faithful with the little I entrusted to you, so you will be governor of 10 cities as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. You will be governor over five cities. Verse 20, but the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. I was afraid because you're a hard man to deal with. Taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. You wicked servant, the king roared. Your own words condemn you. If you knew that I'm a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Hello, somebody. Verse 24, then, turning to the other standing nearby, the king ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. But master, they said, he already has 10 pounds. Yes, the king replied, and to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Sounds a lot like the principle that those who steward little will be entrusted with much. Those who are good stewards, who are faithful with little, will be entrusted with much. I wanna ask you a question this morning. I want you to be honest with yourself. Are you playing offense or defense? Are you playing offense or defense? You're like, what, what do you mean, pastor? Like, explain this a little bit more. Are you going or guarding? Are you taking the gospel or are you hoarding it? Are you going into the world and sharing? Are you going to church on Sundays and guarding? Which one is it? Because we've been given equal opportunity, but as you can see here, we don't have equal results. Now, some of you might be wondering, I've, I've titled this message today, Gospel Entrepreneur. Gospel Entrepreneur. Now, the definition of an entrepreneur is this. It is a person who organizes and manages any enterprise, usually with considerate initiative and risk. Oh, I love that. Any entrepreneurs, any, any business folks in the room today? Yeah, you're leading because you're willing to take the initiative and the risk. I wrote a definition for a gospel entrepreneur. Do you want it today? Yeah. A gospel entrepreneur is someone who manages their spiritual capital with considerate initiative and risk. Oh, look to your neighbor and say, it's time to get risky. You're playing it too safe. You're playing it too safe. This is how it feels. This is, this is how it can feel. Can we be honest in church today? Do, do you, ever, you ever walk into like a coffee shop or into your workplace and you know, the spirit of God starts stirring you up. You know that you're supposed to go talk to somebody or pray for somebody or bless somebody. And then all of a sudden you start getting all these sorts of thoughts coming into your mind. Like, what are they gonna think? What are they gonna say about me? What if, what, 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 all this noise starts coming into your mind, doesn't it? And here's the, here's the reality. When you get in those situations, you, you feel a little bit of, of adrenaline, don't you? you? You feel a little bit of that risk. I say this, 
When you start to feel the discomfort, don't run from it, lean into it. You can have comfort or growth, but you can't have both, my friends. Don't run from the discomfort, lean into it. Wherever you start to feel that adrenaline, run towards it, lean into it, put it to good use. It makes me think about this time where um, I went bungee jumping once. Oh, geez, I, went, I don't think I would do it now with children and with kids, that's just too risky. I'm not telling you to be that crazy, but here's what I know is that I remember the feeling of going up in this building and they strap you up and then there's these double doors and right before you're about to go out these double doors, they kind of push you out and as they're shutting the doors, they're like, you better be, oh, you better be careful. You should have told me that 30 minutes when I was on the bottom floor. I can't go anywhere but off this building now. What in the world? You know, they're just like planting those Seeds of fear, and I think the enemy loves to do that. Right when we're on the cusp of breakthrough, right when you're about to step out, right when you're about to take the risk, right when you're about to share that thing, the enemy plants a seed of doubt. He says, oh, what are they gonna think about you? Or what are they gonna say? Or what if you do this? Or what if you don't have the right words? Oh, we rebuke that in the name of Jesus. We're gonna step out in boldness and in faith. We're gonna get risky, and we're gonna take initiative. Why? Because Jesus has called us to it. The power is in the message not the messenger, right? Are you with me today? So we walk this out. We steward this gospel. We steward this gospel because receivers of the gospel should always become transmitters of the gospel. I I think about what the King James Version says in verse 13. It says this, invest this for me while I'm gone. Occupy until I come. How many of you know, I love that language. It's almost like it's a reminder that we're not on a playground, but we're in a battlefield. That we've got to occupy enemy territory while we have breath in our lungs. I love the early church. When you go read Acts, and we're going to finish the year in this book, and I just love it. But how many of you remember, how many believers were in the upper room before the Spirit of God came upon them in Acts chapter 1? How many? 120, he must be a pastor in the front row. Hello. (laughs) He's a self-feeder. In Acts chapter 2, it became how many? (laughs) 3,000. Phone cap went, oh, somebody in the back's got that too. In Acts 4, 5,000 were added. If I'm doing math right, it's about 8,000 people. And here's what the counselors in Jerusalem said in Acts 5 and 6. It said this, that you are filling Jerusalem with the message. Oh, church, would that be true of our life? Would they say about love church? Would they say about you and I individually? Oh, they're filling the city of Omaha with the gospel. They're filling the city with the message. Now, guess what? That's why we are launching Love Church North Omaha today. Because there's a corner of our city that needs Jesus and that needs the self-feeding virus. We know that there are people all across this city that need to get to know God one day at a time through their Bible. Are you with me today? But here's what I was thinking about. As proud as I am to be a part of a church that's sending and reaching and going, here's the reality is one day I'm gonna stand before Jesus and I'm gonna give an account for my life. I believe that as a leader of this church, I will give an account on behalf of how we stewarded the leadership of this church. But friends, make no mistake about it. We can be a part of a reaching church, but not be a reaching individual. Am I participating or spectating? Am I looking to Pastor Jim to go share the gospel and reach people? Or am I looking in the mirror and saying, God, use me. I've been given the same commodity that he's been given. Let me go ahead and put this thing to work. Let me go ahead and put this thing to work. Equal opportunity, but not equal results. And here's here's what I want us to to catch this morning is I think this is important for us to get. Is as I look at the, the difference in how these opportunities were stewarded. In other words, two of the servants multiplied, one of the servants hid it. And I started asking the question like, why did he hide it? Because I think there's many of us, if we're honest, we can relate to this. And I'm, let me just be real with the church. Man, in this season, in the midst of everything that's been going on, it's so easy when you're under stress and pressure to get self-consumed. Are you with me today, church? 
So I'm not preaching at you today like I don't have this figured out. As a matter of fact, when I read this text, I identified with the, ser- the third servant a little bit more. I started asking myself some hard questions and here's, here's the reality though. It said this, uh, he said this, the third servant said, I was afraid because you're a hard man to deal with taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. Here's what I know about this third servant is the way he saw his master determine the way that he stewarded his opportunity. What he believed about his master determined how he behaved while he was away. In other words, his delusion fueled his disobedience. He had a wrong view of God. He had a wrong view of his master. He had a wrong view of his nobleman. As a matter of fact, what if he just was assuming that he wasn't gonna come back? I think there's a lot of Christians that don't understand that Jesus is coming back. That you and I will give an account for our life. It's this lack of understanding. It's this this gap of knowledge. But I'm here to declare in this house today, why do you think we're so crazy about the self-feeding virus? It's so that you can get to know who God is. So when you're in a financial struggle and the enemy says you're not gonna make it, you can stand on the fact that my God is Jehovah Jireh. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added to me. I take every thought captive and make it obedient to what? My feelings? To my my opinion? To what the news says? No, I make it obedient to what? The word of God. The word of God. This is what Jesus did. Come on, we should be getting fired up right now because Jesus gave you a sword. He gave you a weapon. He gave you a weapon to put to work. Jesus showed us what this looks like. The enemy comes to tempt him three times and every time he responds with what? The word of God. So we've got to plant the word in our hearts so that we can respond when the enemy comes to attack. A.W. Tozer said this, he said this, nothing twists and deforms the soul more than a low or unworthy concept of God. Nothing twists the soul more. So where do we get a healthy concept of who our God is? Where do we get it? The what? And the word is what? It was, it's alive, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. We don't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. Is anybody thankful for the word of God this morning? Come on. Who wants to be faithful in the room? Who wants to be fruitful in the room? You gotta get a right view of who God is. Because here's what I know. Every believer who stewards their opportunity gets a a reward and avoids a rebuke. But every believer, my friends, that squanders their opportunity gets a rebuke and avoids a reward. Do you want a reward or a rebuke? Here's what I came in here to declare today that your faithfulness in this season will determine your usefulness in the kingdom to come. You know what the reward was for those that were faithful? More work. More work. Somebody say work it. Work it, it was more work. And here's what I know. It was rulership over cities. When Jesus comes back, We're gonna rule and reign for a thousand years. Come on, baby. We get to be co-heirs. We get to co-reign with Jesus. And our faithfulness now determines our usefulness then. Do y'all wanna be faithful? Somebody say, work your weight. Work your weight. We gotta work our weight. You can either waste it or you can work it. Waste your work, waste your weight and be rebuked or work your weight and be rewarded. Here's what we need to know as we close and stand our feet. As we stand to our feet, here's what we need to know. They're like, did he really tell me to stand? Is he giving me permission to stand? Yes, I am. Man, y'all must be locked in. Stay locked in with me. Come on, stay locked in with me here as we close. You can waste it or you can work. What we need to know is that we are living right now in between verse 14 and 15. After he was crowned king, he returned and called his servants to whom he had given the money. Right now, 
we're waiting on the return. So the question is, is while you're waiting, how will you be found stewarding? While you're waiting, how are you going to spend your time? While you're waiting, how are you gonna spend your money? While you're waiting, how are you gonna spend your influence? While you're waiting, how are you gonna invest? While you're waiting, let's get to work, baby. Somebody say, be light. We're gonna be light everywhere we go this week. We're gonna be salt and light. We're gonna live such a precarious life that people are gonna look at you, young man, and they're gonna say, man, what are you carrying? Why do you have peace when I don't? Why do you have confidence when I don't? They're gonna look at you and they're gonna say, man, when you made that business decision under so much pressure, how did you control yourself? Or man, I noticed that when Sally gave you that dirty look and was snarky with you, you responded with love. How in the world did you do that? You're gonna say, because of Jesus. Somebody say, I'm gonna be light. I'm gonna be light. The, th the second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna invite. Somebody say, invite. When's the last time we brought somebody around our dinner table that didn't think like us, that didn't talk like us, that didn't act like us? When did we serve somebody at our dinner table? Could we just invite somebody to have dinner with us? Jesus did this all the time. Could we also just extend an invitation to church? When's the last time you personally invited somebody to join you here on a Sunday? This next week, could we take that challenge? And then the third thing is this, is we need to recite. We need to be ready in all seasons to be able to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've gotta start taking these on the surface conversations and turning them spiritual. I love how Pastor Jim does this. He's always got a story in his back pocket. He doesn't just go straight for the jugular. He always builds this great rapport. He starts asking people questions about themselves, about their upbringing, about this, about where they're working, about what they're doing. And then at some point he begins to ask them like, do you have a faith background? Or he'll just start to turn the tide on the conversation to a spiritual conversation. And you know how many times he shows up into our office with a testimony of somebody coming to Jesus because of his willingness to go there. Church, let's be a people that will be light, that will invite, and will recite. Can we do that? Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for stirring us up today. Father, we, we want to be found faithful. We want to be faithfully obedient to what you've called us to. We want to be like the two servants that when you return or when you call us home, we can say, God, look at the multiplication. Father, I pray right now over those that feel a level of pressure or stress to perform or strive. Your word declares not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. And so, God, we're going to yield to your spirit. We're going to do what John 15 talks about. We're going to abide in the vine. And we know that as we abide, as we commit to faithfulness, you will produce fruitfulness. Father, that as we sow seed, you'll water it and you'll cause it to harvest. Jesus, we wanna partner with you this week. Father, we gather in this house so that we can scatter and make a difference in the earth. In Jesus' mighty name. Now, before we say amen, I want somebody to catch this in here today because I really believe this. Yeah, let's break that down for just a second. No, just minimal drums, because I want somebody to catch this right now. Yeah, right there, that's perfect. Not everybody that was in this story was a servant. In this story, in this parable, we see it in verse 14 that he, re he references the, this crowd that's against him as these people. But listen to what verse 27 says, and he says this, and as for these enemies of mine, so in one verse he's calling them people, in this verse he's calling them enemies. The enemies of mine who didn't want me to be their king, bring them in and execute them right here in front of me. Now this is strong language. But I want us to understand in this room today that when you and I stand before our king to give an account for our life, we're either gonna receive a reward, we're gonna receive a rebuke, or we're gonna receive retribution. 
Somebody has to pay for our sin, and it can be either Jesus, and you can receive that, or you're gonna stand before and have to give an account and make payment for that sin against the God that loves you. As I was preparing for this message, I felt like what the Holy Spirit was speaking to me was that there are some of you that have been living in defiance towards God, that have been living in rebellion. And really your defiance and your rebellion is connected to some pain and some heartache and to some hurt and to some disappointment. You're thinking to yourself, how could this good God be a loving God if he allowed this to happen in my life? The enemy has twisted that lie. The enemy's the one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But my God came to give you life and life to the full. He came to give you the abundant life. He came to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could think, ask, or imagine. And here's what I believe, that in this place today, there are some of you that you're gonna move from being defiant to being delivered, from being rebellious to being released into your purpose, into a relationship with Jesus, into hope, into a carrier of the gospel. Listen, you've been searching and running to all these places to be fulfilled. And maybe your life isn't broken. Maybe you didn't receive a a diagnosis. Maybe you're not struggling with addiction. Maybe you just came in here today and you've got a big house. You've got a healthy marriage. You've got a nice car and a booming business, but something on the inside is empty. I'm here to declare in this place today that the only thing that will fulfill and satisfy is a relationship with the one who made you with the one who knows you, with the one who died for you. The same revelation that I had in that car in 2007 is the same revelation that you could have today. And I believe this much, that Jesus brought you in this place today to deposit spiritual capital on the inside of you. That he's not just saving you to spend eternity with you, but he actually wants to put heaven in you so that you can begin walking in purpose. That's the opportunity in the room today. So why would you wait any longer? And I, right now, I rebuke a spirit of fear that today, in this place, here's what I know, that when one person comes home, the angels in heaven are praising. And you better believe that we're gonna do the same in here. So as the band plays, if you're in this place today, you could be in the top. Maybe you've been coming to this church for years, but today is the day of salvation. We declare it over you today. God has more for you and you know it. Don't leave here with leanness in your soul. Leave here filled up today. As the band plays, make your way forward if you wanna make peace.